Welcome back to another episode of College Town Talk. I'm Shan Stout. And I'm Jonathan Frank. Now today we are joined by two remarkable women who have impacted Tennessee Tech and the Cookville region in profound ways. They truly have. Uh, we're talking to Tennessee Tech alumna, former Golden Eagle soccer star, and officiant at the 2023 Women's World Cup, Brooke Mayo. She's going to take us behind the scenes of one of the biggest sporting events in the world and tell us how her background at Tech helped make this dream of hers possible. And we're also joined by Tennessee Tech piano professor Catherine Godis, who is about to mark 30 years of living, teaching, and performing right here in Tennessee's college town. We're going to talk to her about her decades-long musical career, and we're going to have a very personal conversation about how her late husband's time in Nazi concentration camps during World War II inspires her work to combat anti-Semitism today. It's such an important and timely conversation. I know I know we were both uh, moved by what Dr. Godis shared with us in that interview. But up first, it's our conversation with Tennessee Tech soccer alum and 2023 Women's World Cup officiant, Brooke Mayo. Welcome back to College Town Talk. We are now joined by Tennessee Tech alumna and 2023 Women's World Cup officiant, Brooke Mayo. Now, Brooke is a 2011 Tech graduate with a degree in exercise science. She was a breakout star on the Golden Eagle women's soccer team where she played from 2007 to 2010. Then after graduating, Brooke parlayed her love of soccer into roles, including her most recent position as assistant athletic director at Stewart's Creek High School in Smyrna. But now Brooke is a full-time soccer officiant. Now, it's safe to say that the decision paid off because Brooke was one of only four American referees selected to officiate the World Cup's final match held between Spain and England. This blew my mind when it happened. We were all excited for you, Brooke. Now, you may have seen where Tennessee Tech shared a feature story earlier this fall about Brooke's experiences at the World Cup. The response was overwhelming, and we knew we had to ask her onto the show to talk with us more about it. So, Brooke, welcome to College Town Talk. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on, on the podcast and to talk about Tennessee Tech. I try to talk about Tennessee Tech in my times in Cookville as much as possible, so thanks for having me. Well, we're thrilled that you are here. Now, your alma mater, along with the entire Cookville community, was so proud to see you step onto the turf as assistant referee at the 2023 Women's World Cup. Now, I know that it was a very drawn out, rigorous process to be selected to officiate. Now, I'm curious, can you tell us about the exact moment that you found out you were officially in? Was it a phone call, a letter, carrier pigeon? Do you remember how you felt in that exact moment? Yeah, so <laughs> the story of finding out is a little underwhelming uh, because you have to remember time zones around the world and when news is breaking is at all different times. And I was actually visiting in Colorado and it was early morning and I looked at my text messages and WhatsApp is a text message. Um, and that's how we text around the world. And my friends around the world started congratulating me. <laughs> And I remember just thinking, is this real? Uh, I didn't see anything on any websites. I didn't have anything in my email. I so was just you receiving- So found out secondhand. I mean, it was yes. like, you you weren't the first to know. <laughs> Correct. I just had made friends with some other referees around the world and I'm guessing they their, their list got released to them. And I was like, wow, I guess this is real. It's really happening. And I started calling all my friends and probably shed a tear or two. and thinking about all the years of work leading up to that and thinking, wow, this is, this is real. It's finally happening. <laughs> well, and I love, I love the fact that, you know, you said it was underwhelming, but that's a pretty funny story, Brooke. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's hilarious that you're like, I'm not even sure if I can validate what they're saying. Like, is this true? Is it a rumor? Uh, that's, that's really, really great. And I haven't thought about when you um, are going out for a world position 
how you have all these different communication barriers going on. So I, I think that's fantastic. Yep. And like any good um, person I took to Twitter to confirm. <laughs> Well, Brooke, as Shan shared in the introduction, you're now officiating full time. And uh, I've got to imagine that was a big step, a leap of faith. Um, looking back now that you've officiated the biggest game in all of women's soccer, it, it probably seems like an easy decision. But but was that a hard call at the time? Yeah, it's been really challenging. Um, when I first got interviewed, I actually was interviewed by Kevin Dyson. <laughs> um, any Tennessee would be uh, familiar with that name, but he was the, he was the athletic director of Stewart's Creek High School at the time. And he interviewed me and I talked about my love of officiating, how I wanted to continue that as well as giving back to the Stewart's Creek High School community as a soccer coach and a teacher. He hired me and our principal, Dr. Harrell, who's still the principal there was on board with letting me continue this journey while being a teacher and a coach at Stewart's Creek High School. But it was always really challenging because I had to take a lot of time off um, to pursue refing. We're gone for weeks at a time sometimes and leaving my students and my athletes was very difficult. Um, but in the long run, I know that it paid off because I can't tell you how many of my students and athletes reached out to me during the World Cup saying how cool it was to see me like they got to see the journey and the work and then seeing what it led to. So pretty cool to see that it did pay off. And I know my time away might've been hard in the moment, but for them, it was seeing if you put in hard work, it pays off in the long run. And um, yeah. And then quitting my job uh, challenging. I, I left a, a really good community, um, a really good administration and a paycheck, a monthly paycheck and health insurance. And I left my security blanket essentially to chase this dream that I've always had. And yes, it's paid off, um, but no, it wasn't easy. And I think everyone when they're chasing their dreams has this sacrifice and kind of leap of faith you have to make um, in any profession. So no, it was not easy. I'm thankful I've done it. And I'm thankful that Stewart's Creek and Rutherford County gave me the security while I was training to eventually be able to be successful as a referee. Well, I know that you have been a beautiful mentor to your students and, um, so many women. I mean, I remember that moment, you know, when we received the information, that you had been appointed, we thought, oh my goodness, this is this is such an honor. It's such a big deal. We felt the weight of that. And I think that you probably are a mentor to so many young girls that you may never meet. And I, I think that's just lovely. Now you've accomplished so much since graduating from tech in 2011, but I want you to wind the clock back to when you were a student. Tell us about maybe some of your memories from that time. Um, I hear a rumor that you even performed stand-up comedy at the Backdoor Playhouse. Is that really a thing? That's really a thing. Um, thank you to Andrew Smith for setting those uh, open mic nights up. And thank you to my teammates for kind of pushing me. Um, I was in band all throughout high school and I was a drum major and um, I had to commit to being a full-time athlete and student at Tennessee Tech, and I kind of missed being on the stage. And when I saw those flyers popping up, my friends kind of encouraged me to to sign up because I guess they thought I was funny. And uh, it it paid off. I mean, looking back at those times, I was on the stage with Jake Hoot. I was on the stage with Corey Wheeler. I was on the stage with all these other pe people in my community that were impactful and telling jokes or poems and it was kind of before video and TikTok and Instagram yeah I was still T9 texting and so we just got to be in the moment um, with our community and our fellow peers and students and share these talents outside of the classroom and I really I really have fond memories of that in being able to um share those moments and honestly put myself out of my comfort zone and test myself in uncomfortable territory and getting out on the stage. And I think that paid off, you know, getting on a field and being uncomfortable and reaching and getting out of your comfort zone. And um, there's a lot of similarities in just taking a chance and taking a risk and enjoying the moment with the people around you. 
and yeah, I love my time at Tech. And those were just one of the many times, you know, uh, that I remember fondly. Brooke, we had a chance to talk earlier this fall for the written story we did for the Tech website about your experiences at the World Cup. And you said this line uh, that I loved. Uh, I'm, I'm quoting you here. You said, I have always loved this beautiful game and how it brings the world together. And it got me thinking about how events like the World Cup, the Olympics, even the Super Bowl are these uh, kind of shared moments in our culture where everyone can, you know, come together across ideological lines and enjoy a game. And sports has been such a big part of your life. You've played it, coached it, refereed it. Uh, I'm guessing you believe that soccer specifically can play a meaningful role in bridging some pretty big divides. Yeah, sports and specifically soccer has undoubtedly made me a better person. And getting to travel and really talk to people. I think one thing we're missing right now, we have huge, huge issues in America, but I think we, we can't talk to each other. And we we struggle to talk to people that are different than us. And in soccer, it forces you to talk to people that are different than you and listen to people that are different than you. And I think when we talk and we listen and then we share this love, we are able to really hear each other and have some empathy for people that are different than us. And also traveling makes me more appreciative of the United States. And every time I come back, I'm thankful to come back and have the amenities. And uh, I mean, I can drink water out of my faucet. It sounds so silly, but you don't realize how you take take things for granted until you do travel. And then being able to travel and... Um, it made me be able to connect to my students differently because I have a student has that's just moved here from somewhere. I guarantee you I can drop a name about soccer and now they instantly feel connected because I know someone from their country or I've ref someone from their country. Um, so I really, God, the soccer has just brought me so many cool opportunities. And even traveling to my first World Cup, I got to go with my fellow Tennessee Tech athletes. Lloyd Harris, who played on the tennis team, offered up his home, as well as two other people in South Africa at the time. And I traveled with Yanni, who was from Australia, who we went to the World Cup together. And then now I'm getting, he got to see my first game at the World Cup. He was there cheering me on and giving me the biggest hug after the match. So it's so cool now um, to see how it's brought brought the world together. It's made me a better person. And I try to... Um, Yeah, I try to share that love and I try to share it as a, I try to tell my students that I had that your sport can be a vehicle for you if you allow it to, so. Brooke, I can see now that uh, when you decide to retire from being an official, you have a very uh, lucrative career in motivational speaking. (laughs) I appreciate your message. I appreciate your view in, uh, it, it is a global view. You now have a global view and a global impact because you can relate to even more people across the world and you're using that as a tool and a resource for you to grow as a person and to help them grow. I love everything about your message. Now, finally, Brooke, um, I really hate that this interview is coming to an end because it's been a wonderful interview. I appreciate your time, but we like to end each interview with the same question. What is one way that Tennessee Tech has impacted your life? I can't imagine having gone to any other university. I feel like it was meant to be, and I'm from Texas originally, and I just knew I wanted to get out. And thank goodness I ended up at Tennessee Tech at the time and things worked out because I feel like I really learned the tools needed to be successful. Not only did I receive like a good education in the classroom, but like my professors just taught me how to be a good person and how to to make relationships and have relationships with people. And I feel like all of these little life lessons I learned, um, it, yes, the classroom was good, but also just the relationships I had with my professors and the tools that they taught me allowed me to be a successful teacher, allowed me to be a successful referee, a successful administrator. And I'm really thankful for my time at Tennessee Tech. And I feel like I have friends, 
you know, all over the world because of Tennessee Tech. And I also have skills that'll make me successful in any any avenue I decide to pursue. Brooke, we have loved this conversation. Thank you so much for being our guest today on College Town Talk. Thank you guys for having me. And I am so excited to see Cookville continuing to grow as well as Tennessee Tech University and all of the upgrades. Every time I go back to campus, it's just nicer and nicer. So thank you for having me and hopefully I'll be on campus soon. Welcome back to College Town Talk. We are now joined by Tennessee Tech Professor of Piano, Dr. Catherine Godis. Dr. Godis has mentored and served Tennessee Tech students for nearly 30 years since coming to the university in 1994. She holds degrees from West Virginia University and a Doctor of Musical Arts and Piano Performance from the Cincinnati Conservatory. Dr. Godis was married to renowned Latvian pianist Herman Godis, a Steinway artist and artist-in-residence at West Virginia University until his passing in 2007. They formed the Godis Piano Duo and toured across the United States and Europe. The late Herman Godis was also a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II. He remarkably survived the horrors of the camps and resumed his career in music after his release. Amid a troubling rise in anti-Semitism in parts of the country today, we wanted to learn from Dr. Godis about not just her musical experiences and her years at Tennessee Tech, but also her husband's story and how she honors his memory by working to combat anti-Semitism and bigotry today. Dr. Godis, welcome to College Town Talk. We're so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and I really appreciate this opportunity, and nice to meet you. Dr. Godis, next year will mark 30 years that you have been here at Tennessee Tech, right here in Cookville. What does that milestone mean to you? And how have you seen the university and the community change during that time? And that's a great question. Things certainly have changed, uh, but things change that must change. And certainly technology has changed the complexion of the university greatly. But for me, I see greater diversity among the students. Um, There's so many more resources now for both faculty and students that we didn't have originally. But for me, one of the biggest changes is that the School of Music is now a separate entity. It's It's a part of the College of Fine Arts. Originally, we were part of the College of Education. And someone like me, who's primarily a performer, I felt like that wasn't the greatest fit. But now that we're a separate entity, it has really remarkably changed. We do things that are more concentrated on musical development, performance, education. And we've also added so many more degrees, which broaden the perspective of the students that we attract. We have a new degree in um which is really exciting in audio technology, in theater. We also have a new degree, the Bachelor of Science with a music concentration. And originally we basically had the performance degree or education, but now we attract students who are not necessarily going to be performers or educators, but they're passionate about music and they want to combine that in their overall education. So, It's exciting to work with students from different backgrounds. Uh, You know, I still have my bulk of performance majors, of course, but it's just a more exciting environment uh, to work in and to use my talents to reach out to these students. So those are, you know, the amazing changes, but Tennessee Tech has always been a, a great university, but now I think it's even greater in that we've, we see more diversity and more types of students and, it's just a more exciting environment. Dr. Godis, you've obviously impacted many lives uh, in the years you've been in Cookville, and we reached out to one of those people in the course of preparing for this interview, and that is your colleague and friend, Josh Davis, who is also uh, an accompanist uh, for our listeners, an accompanist here at Tennessee Tech. And Josh said this, uh, I'm going to uh, quote here. He said, it is impossible to put into words the profound impact that Dr. Godis has had on me, both musically and personally. She's not only been a huge musical influence in my life, who offered much-needed guidance throughout my teenage years, but she's also a dear friend and my favorite person to collaborate with. Her passion, artistry, enthusiasm, and love for music and the arts will continue to inspire me and stay with me throughout my life. 
what does it mean to you to hear tributes like that from people you've impacted um, in your time here at Tennessee Tech? I know, I know there are so many others who could, who could give similar messages. That was just one of them. But what, what does that mean to you when you hear messages like that? Um, it's overwhelming. The greatest joy for me is to see my students succeed. You know, I work one-on-one with students in the studio and we, we have a special bond, you know, that one-on-one teaching. And to see a student develop both as a musician, as a pianist, technically and musically mature, uh, that's the greatest joy. And when I see a, per, a, a student years later um, and see their success, uh, it's the greatest joy in my life. There's no question about it. I've often, Josh, of course, was an amazing student. I worked with him all through junior high and high school, and then he was a student here at Tech. An amazing talent. And now I'm so thrilled that he's an adjunct faculty member here. We collaborate as a duo piano team, and he's really a spectacular pianist and a wonderful friend. And I deeply appreciate his words. It means so much to me as a teacher, for sure. Well, you are obviously well-loved at the university, and we appreciate what you do. But let's get to a deeper level today, because you have an interesting story to share. Now, we've seen disturbing headlines in parts of the country and across the world in recent weeks about anti-Semitism. Now, sadly, the Anti-Defamation League reports a dramatic increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. over the last month. I know this issue is deeply personal for you, given your husband's story. Can you tell us more about him, his background, what he endured in the Nazi concentration camps, and then on the high note, how you ultimately found each other? Yes. Well, Herman was um, a young upcoming pianist in in the beautiful city of Riga. Um, His mother was a concert pianist and a wonderful teacher. He was a young man studying in Paris during the summer of of, of 1938 uh, with the great pianist Robert Casa de Sioux when he heard that Hitler was moving into the Baltic states. So Herman returned home to be with his parents. And as as we now know, uh, the Nazis moved in very quickly on the Jewish community, middle of the night, knocked on the door, uh, broke in. The, his parents were taken to what's called the Riga ghetto, as was Herman. And the Nazis took over everything in their house, paintings, his beautiful Bechstein piano. And his parents survived several months in the Riga ghetto. Um, but then they were massacred at the famous uh, night, December 8th, when they were marched out, all of the partic- the older people, into the woods and they were forced to dig a grave and they were lined up and shot and fell into the grave. Herman was younger and they didn't pick on the younger people, but he was sent to concentration camp, book involved. And that began began his four year internment in concentration camp. And he survived. He often told me he survived because he was young. He was of use to the Nazis. He, He was strong and he could build things worked on automobiles. And he often said that you can survive starvation, lice, humiliation. You can survive all those things, cold, but you can't survive the gas chamber and you can't survive a bullet. So you do what you can each day just to try to get through. And of course he was this up and coming pianist and his whole life was then survive somehow survive. He did not know what happened to his parents, but he assumed the worst. Then upon liberation in 1945, he immigrated to the United States. He resumed his career and, um, you know, he began performing under management. And then eventually he took the artist in residency position at West Virginia University, where he continued to perform and teach. He was a wonderful teacher. And I was his student. Um, I heard him play a concert in New York City where I grew up, fell in love with his playing and wrote to him, went to audition for him, and he accepted me as a student. So after several years, um, we got very close and eventually married. And we were married for 35 years, and it was a blessing. It was the most amazing life. Even though we had a great age difference, 
we were one soul, you know, we're both. Kind your, of, cores, both your cores were the uh, same. Both kind of crazy, practicing all the time, performing and teaching. When I first took the job at Tennessee Tech, Herman came with me, of course. He had retired recently from West Virginia, and he began a second career here in Cookville. You know, and when people learned his story, he would give recitals and Pat Wattenbarger was packed. And even local high schools reached out to him, teachers wanting Herman to come and talk to classes as a concentration camp survivor to describe what that experience was like. And that was a, a fascinating time that so many teachers wanted Herman to speak to their classes. And it was a very moving experience for him. And he would talk to the kids about what it was like. And he would also tell them that the key is to educate yourself about the sources of anti-Semitism, what led to it, the history of the Jewish people, uh, why the formation of Israel was so important. And the more they understood the horrors of this great genocide, uh, he said, that's the key to understand. You can't just understand superficially. You have to go back and educate yourselves. And they loved hearing from Herman. He was really quite charming. Um, he wasn't the greatest public speaker, but he was very honest and very sincere. Uh, he also did a testimonial under the Spielberg Foundation for the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And so it's on record. He, his story has been recorded, of course, because most survivors have died. Um, but it was an extraordinary experience. And to see an outpouring of interest in his story here in Cookville was very, very important to both of us, for sure. Well, yeah. Dr. Gerdes, I think the beautiful part of the story of his life is his willingness to share what yes. he went through. I mean, people have gone through much less tragic circumstances yes. they don't talk about. And he yes. was so open and willing do you think that was maybe a part of him, um, his strength or his ability to overcome? I mean, was that just something that was built into him as a person? One of the things that attracted to me, to Herman, was his optimism and his joy of life. His philosophy was not all Germans were bad. He said that hatred is learned. And he said uh, Hitler's movement started very gradually. And he said there were wonderful German people who helped him upon liberation. And he, he didn't hold a grudge. Uh, we, were, we went back, traveled to Germany many times, and uh, many of his friends and, and relatives would, were very bitter about what happened, but not Herman. He said, I'm so happy to have survived. There are good Germans, there are bad Germans, but I love people. And, and he was just going to enjoy life to the fullest. Um, and he embraced that. He loved to play tennis. He loved good food. He loved good wine. He loved to live life. You know, he, he just took each day uh, as if it, it was a new experience for him. And I think his artistry grew because of this strength in him. He was His playing was so communicative. When he played, he played from his soul. And I think that's why people loved his playing so much. He really communicated through the piano. Um, that goes deep that you, you just don't learn that, you know, that comes from within. And uh, so the thing that drew me to him was this, this optimism, this joy of life. I tend to be very, um, <laughs> I'm a very stressful person. And sometimes I, you know, take life too stressfully. And he would always be a calming effect on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I miss that terribly, as I'm sure, you know, that can, that can happen. But he was, he was a man who lived the good life. He lived life to the fullest and he gave back to his students. He was a wonderful teacher. And, um, you know, I was just so proud to have shared my life with him. It was, you know, it was a special gift for sure. Mm, that is such a, a, a beautiful and moving story, Dr. Godis. Uh, I want to ask you, for uh, college students here at Tech, uh, other, other students today that might be listening to this, they are, you know, they're learning history. They're, they're taking in all that's happening in the news right now, including the, the unrest in the Middle East, and they are forming their own values and, and you know, figuring out what they believe. What do you want them to know about 
anti-Semitism and other forms of prejudice? That's a great question, Jonathan. And I teach a lot of class piano sections as well as my private students. And very often I try to talk to the kids outside of just piano. I try to tell them about history and occasionally it comes up about my husband. And when I tell them a little bit about Herman and concentration camp, I'm always amazed at how little the students really know and they're fat. They want me to tell them about what happened. And I'm always a little bit shocked that they don't know that already, but I'm, I, I try to educate them. And I always tell students that you have to educate yourself. Um, uh, Anti-Semitism has been around for a long time, but we normally associate it with white supremacists. But now that it's leaking into college campuses, and often it's ignored as political speech, that is very dangerous. And I think it shows a lack of understanding of the history of anti-Semitism started really in biblical times, uh, which was basically a religious uh, anti-Semitism. Anti then it, it eventually became um, ethnic and racial um, anti-Semitism with Hitler and of course, that was that was it still pervades our society, unfortunately. But we also see hatred to black people, to Muslims, to gay people. And I always tell students, <clears throat> don't believe what you hear on the internet. <clears throat> Be careful what sources you learn, take your information from. Young people are very susceptible to their environment. And if they grow up in an environment which preaches hate against a, a certain people, I tell students, you have to go outside of that environment and you have to trust yourself to educate yourself. Um, don't believe everything that you hear. Dive deeper. Do some, do some research on your own. Go to the Holocaust Museum and see firsthand. There are Holocaust deniers. All you have to do is go to the Holocaust Museum or research it and find out for yourself these deniers are telling you a lie. Um, and that goes, you know, I believe that children in school need to learn about the Holocaust. They need to learn about anti-Semitism, about slavery, what is at the root of, uh, you know, prejudice against black people and so on. And I think, I think that the more students trust their own morality and education and brain to do their own research they will make their own decisions. And I think that is the key, that's important. And to always remember that we're all humans, we're all a part of this world and that we all come from different backgrounds. And, you know, I grew up in New York City, so I grew up in diversity, you know, I grew up with also. Now, a lot of our students are from small rural towns and maybe they're not exposed to the diversity that I did, but um, at the university they are and they need to embrace that diversity and figure things out themselves. That's important. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Godis. Now we like to end each interview with the same question. What is one way that Tennessee Tech has impacted your life? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, it was a dream job. I had just finished my doctorate at CCM and I started to apply for piano professorships. And I had several interviews, but Tennessee Tech was the one that I accepted and it changed my life. Um, it gave me an opportunity to not just teach piano and perform, but I have a lot of other talents. Like I love giving speeches. I love organizing events. So since coming here, I started the TTU piano competition, started the BSO pre-concert lecture series, it gave me opportunities to uh, teach history, which I, you know, my, my approach to teaching is a very comprehensive one. I want students to understand the history of music, the form, the theory behind it, the performance practice. And Tennessee Tech really gave me that opportunity to spread my wings and do so many things um, while remaining at the core, a pianist and a teacher. But I have loved being in Cookville. I've loved being embraced by the by the people of Cookville. Um, I still miss New York City. It's still in my blood. 
but I do enjoy it so much. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful university. And it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to, to do all the things that I've always wanted to do. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for your time today. I was personally excited about your interview because I have a background in classical piano. Oh, okay. And I don't know if, if you're like me, it was almost therapy for me. It's almost like being an athlete because I would practice like 18 hours a week and mm -hmm. it, it kind of takes you out of your own mind and puts you in this creative yes. space where you have to just focus on one thing. Yes, uh, yes. I, I love that about it. And it was it was very useful to me. And a lot of times that's how I manage stress is uh, through music. And so uh, I just appreciate that the arts are still thriving and alive and well, and especially in our community in Cookville. So thank you for what you do. Thank you so much for being our guest today on College Town Talk. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Jonathan. I do appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Godis. And for our listeners, you can learn more about Tennessee Tech's School of Music, including Dr. Godis's classes and upcoming recitals by visiting tntech.edu slash music. Uh, what great guests we had today. We want to thank Brooke Mayo and Dr. Catherine Godis for being our guests on College Town Talk. Absolutely. And by the way, if you're enjoying this podcast, please take a moment to subscribe, review, and share with your friends. It all helps to spread the word about the great things happening right here in Cookville. We'll meet you back here again next week for more conversations with leaders on and off Tennessee Tech's campus as we celebrate the people and places that make Cookville Tennessee's college town. College Town Talk is presented by Tennessee Tech University in partnership with the Cookville Putnam County Visitors Bureau. Your hosts are Jonathan Frank and Shan Stout, and original music is performed by Andrew Buckner. Visit us online at tntech.edu slash collegetowntalk.